can you talk about the dealers that are saying, well, MMR is eight grand more. It can't be worth this you know, on an EV. But well, Brian, that's an easy one. That's an easy one. That, that's an easy one. But nobody will think about it either. Um, um, when there is finally a, uh, a you know, a, an electric Mercedes or a, an I, whatever it is, BMW or something, you know, name anything. When there finally is a transaction, there was 14 no sales to go along with that transaction. So you're looking at the one car that happened to sell. Somebody bumped their head. Who knows what happened? Or it was in a factory lane. It's another thing that nobody thinks about. When you start looking at results and you're not paying attention to an EV that was sold in a factory lane that happened to have some sort of kickback to the dealer. If he buys X number of EVs, whatever, he gets something back on the parts statement. In other words, you got to take those things in consideration. And that happens frequently, Mo where they're all factory sale uh, uh, results on MMR and no uh, hand-to-hand compact results in in conjunction with, you know, <clears throat> the fact that it's not unusual if you own a car for two or three or four or five or eight or 10,000 less than MMR, an EV, not, I'm not talking about Tesla, that's a totally different story, but a Mercedes, BMW, name something else, Audi, e-tron, it, it it could go to the sale six or seven times before you get a bid. So in other words, that the transaction number that actually turned out to be somebody hit that number, you can't duplicate that. If you can, you're magic. Or you have 30 of them in a row and you created cr- critical mass and started letting them rip where you know, you're going to find what the uh, actual value is, right? So this is another thing when we're using that tool, the auction report tool, you got to take into consideration, is the number you're looking at something that can be duplicated? Is it a one-off something or other? And it brought 20000 more than it's supposed to bring. Different story. That is never going to happen with anybody's EV. Ain't happening, Mo. It's the opposite. We do it every week with these Mercedes Equuses and, uh, and, and e-trons and so forth. We're selling the bitches. In other words, they ain't getting no sale. Um, so, so when when we're dropping a car fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand under MMR, and ain't nobody hit that car yet, tell me exactly what that bitch is worth if you're trying to trade it. <laughs> but somebody's willing to pay for it. That's and and the question becomes if you you're trading that Equus or that uh, Etron at a Lexus store, you tell me what you're going to do with that little baby. You follow me? Um, it's um well that's where i see it where people start running for the hills luckily you know they've got the tool i mean i was recently with one of the sharper used car guys that i've come across in the country and you know 745 a night and a two hundred thousand dollar g-wagon comes into a, a dodge showroom and why did it come into the showroom <clears throat> because our website's the only one that put a number on the car now they, right. they end up making a, a decent wholesale profit but at 7:45 at night, you typically don't have your used car director GSM working at the store, so that's when they need some backup, or at least somebody in the foxhole with them to say, "Yeah, you're good." Yep, that's the whole so concept. One, between we're not saying we're the best number; we're saying we're we are 100 percent a transactional number, no question about that. And uh, in other words, in the vast majority of cases, way more than anything else that I've ever seen or been associated with in valuation. It's a number that you're perfectly comfortable living with and therefore not going to get rid of because you're in a position where you could host the other car and make a profit, but you also uh, have the shot at taking your 30-day run with that bitch yeah, without getting welded into it. Mm-hmm. Right. And typically, so, that, so this is my last question. I'll quit hijacking this call, Sean. But That's the word. The we're on this call because of you, Daddy-O. I'm the one hijacking. Well, I think this is fast, fascinating. But so you both have lanes, and you got cars coming through there. When you've got CarMax buying your cars, mm-hmm. can you walk the listeners through the difference between how CarMax? Because I think their customer appraisal process it mirrors their lane process. But oh, franchise there's, there's, versus CarMax. There's no question. It's morphed over average. time. Also, it's changed over time when uh, uh, Foliar took over. Guy's really smart, and he, he put processes in place. Tom Foliar put processes in place from his experience of being a buyer in the lanes 
that uh, actually, in my estimation, I don't know if he gets the credit for it internally, but he, he changed the CarMax world, in my estimation, only from my own personal experience paying attention. When there's when those folks are bidding on cars in lanes and they're complaining, somebody's complaining that they're paying too much, they're not paying too much. They're paying market value for a very narrow category of car that it could be for wholesale, by the way. They do buy cars and put them in through their into their lanes to with the full intent of making a profit, they bought it in another auction. That's not that arbitrage is not like a secret. Uh, secondly, um that they've actually touched the car. So initially where they were Carfax uh, recessive, like Carvana is Carfax recessive. There's a reason for that. They don't touch cars. Carvana does not touch a car. They don't go have a, a team of 8 million people going and, and <clears throat> like descending on an auction and looking and touching every car. They don't do that. Um, Car, CarMax does. And because of that, they've learned, I think off lease only in Florida actually taught them that there's no need, real need to be completely Carfax or, or auto check recessive. If you touch a car, for the vast majority of times, the Carfax is not accurate. Uh, it doesn't really tell you anything about the damage of the car. But if you watch, and for years, I mean, we had our, our recon shop inside the auction of the world's largest auction for years. Uh, uh, and their team would come in and, and we you, you could watch them actually walk in the lot, come in having a bullshit session with us. Of course, I would never sell them a car outside the auction <clears throat> and make them bid. And you learn, actually, the process. They touch every car. They open every door. They open the hood. They look at things. If the car happens to have a bad Carfax, it is not necessarily affected other than, uh, you know, to, to someone who's going to automatically deduct something for the Carfax based on the condition. You understand? Because they've they've touched it. And because of that, over the years, there's there's sharp auction rat buyers that are running from lane to lane uh, actually would understand and know uh, who the, the the CarMax buyers are. If they're bidding on a car, you don't have to have any fear that the car is not a piece of shit because they've actually extracted all of the... I'll tell you another reason why I know for a fact that this is true. They arbitrate very few cars. Very rare do I... I from the beginning, I always told them, you buy a car from me, you ain't allowed to have it if you don't like it. Just give the bitch back. You follow me? You know, what happens is we might get one out of every 300 back from them because their buyer missed something. Maybe it was pouring rain or who knows what. But because of that, all other buyers that are watching a CarMax bitter bid on a car, the other thing is this, Brian, and you can't forget this, discipline. They will not bid a dollar more than what they've already got on their little sheet. In other words, you can't get them emotionally involved in an auction. I don't care what the car is. And then the last piece of it is they're not buying random cars at the auction. They're buying inside a very narrow, uh, let's call it, category of car. They're not buying every kind of car that comes through the block. If you look at the tens of thousands of cars we've sold them through the years and you put it on a spreadsheet, you can see it as clear as crystal. Uh, uh, the, exactly what they'll buy mileage-wise, condition-wise, Carfax-wise. You see what I'm saying to you? So that's the discipline uh, of professionals that have had the uh, the process put in place. And I guess the, the moral of the story is you're never going to be able to put that same kind of helmet on every single dealer that's using your tool, Brian. But the concept of using, because to be perfectly honest with you, the Honda dealership that you're referring to that you left it this week, that's really what they're doing. In other words, they got a process in place with with characteristics around deviate. cars that that's exactly correct. Period, and and they don't do it with the fear of the sales uh, the, the the buyer being a better salesperson than they are. Where you know the dealer next door gave them sixty thousand more, and on what what kind of car were they buying? And rather than getting in the weeds of that conversation, sticking to your guns and your uh, your process. <laughs> I think the odds yeah, are you're going to come out. Yep. Yeah. I'll just, uh, the other thing that really jumped out of me in this conversation is, is part of the process is don't let people second guess the next step. That's, that's really uh, an amazing, every time you give them an appraisal, don't let them second guess what's the next step. The next step is obviously to sell you the car, but don't give them, you know, I, I don't let them have a, another idea as what to what, to do with that car really and th that's right. really really good <laughs>
So I think that's uh, that's great for today, gentlemen. Uh, really appreciate it. Really a lot of insights in that to unpack. And uh, let's get it out there.